Greetings, dear brothers and sisters, in the holy, mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Once again to Messiah and Messiah alone be all the praise, honor, and glory. And today is the 13th day, right, Anna? Yes. Yeah, today is the 13th day, dear brothers and sisters, of the 8th month of the year 2020. And today we are back as Messiah led us to this journey, the Berean Scripture Contemplations with our 11-year-old, Berean Scripture Contemplations with our 11-year-old. We did our first week, the week one. This is the second week. We thank you once again. Perhaps many of us might have to recall that what we did in the week one. So Anna will do go through the week one. She'll do a brief review of that. So we once again... Thank you so very much, all of dear fellow brethren, for being a part of this journey, for being a part of Berean Scripture contemplation with our 11-year-old. And we once again, once again, pray that may Messiah's Ruach and His Ruach only guide each one of us through this journey so that we can know Messiah more and more and more with every session of this journey. Because this is what the Bible says, dear brothers and sisters, that this is eternal life. This is life eternal to know Hashem and His only begotten Son, Yeshua HaMashiach. John 17, 3 tells us. And dear brothers and sisters, the truth is the only way we can ever, we can ever know Messiah and Hashem. The only way is how Messiah chose to reveal Himself. And that is through His inerrant and infallible and God-breathed word as 2 Timothy 3, 16 tells us. So once again, as we go through this journey, dear brothers and sisters, we welcome you for our week two of this journey. Let us remember that Messiah's word says, Psalm 138, 2 tells us, I, the psalmist says, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. That is quite a statement, dear brothers and sisters. The psalmist says, God has magnified his word above all his name. And God really means what he says and he always says what he means. And this is not a cliche, but a simple truth about Hashem, which we all want to remind ourselves every single day, dear brothers and sisters. We truly need to understand the staggering significance of Messiah's declaration of Hashem's declaration in Psalm 138 too, and take his word with the seriousness with which Messiah with which Hashem has taken because Messiah himself said quoting the Torah that man truly does not live by bread alone but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of Yeshua HaMashiach Matthew 4 4 tells us that so once again dear brothers and sisters as Messiah led us in this journey, leading Anna to contemplate and ruminate on the book of Colossians. Once again, solely guide, guided by his Ruach and his Ruach alone, dear brothers and sisters. The book of Colossians is all about Christology. Christology is study of Christ. In the book of Colossians, Messiah, Yeshua, Hamashiach's preeminent, preeminence is the main theme. Today, the problem is we try to... Keep him somehow prominent as Anna was telling in her message the other day about Philippians 3 when she was talking in the urgent word that some, we try to somehow keep him prominent in our lives but he is not preeminent and how do we keep him preeminent is we need to learn from the book of Colossians dear brothers and sisters because Paul talks about the fullness of Christ and the sufficiency of Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach, Lord Jesus Christ, is the visible form of the invisible God, the prior head of all creation. In Him, the universe was created. He is before the universe. In Him, the universe coheres. He is the head of the body, the church, and the firstborn from among the dead. He is above all of the angels, including Satan. His preeminence, as a matter of fact, Colossians Colossians chapter 1 verses 16 through 19 tells us, declares his preeminence where Paul says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. 
and he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he may have the preeminence reconciled in Christ for it pleased the father that in him all fullness should Dwell. Just staggering, staggering, dear brothers and sisters. Many Bible scholars have concluded that Colossians is the most profound letter Paul ever wrote. And as Messiah has led us and leading us into this journey of Berean scripture contemplations with 11 year old for this week too, once again, dear brothers and sisters, let us together diligently commit ourselves to a careful review of this episode. And it will really empower us in these end moments dear brothers and sisters to combat this encroaching darkness surrounding us in these end of the end moments and it will also sharpen us to exercise our spiritual discernment and moreover it will give us some practical scriptural guidelines about daily walking with our Messiah in these last moments dear brothers and sisters the Bible says Proverbs, I believe Proverbs 27, 17, that as iron sharpens iron. Hebrews 10, 24, 25 says that let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Once again, dear brothers and sisters, we truly, the hallmark of this journey is being an active Berean. That's why Messiah led us this journey to name this journey as Berean scripture contemplations. Dear brothers and sisters, the biblical illiteracy across the platform, across the globe is truly, truly very disturbing. And that is exactly where the enemy tries to get in to deceive us dear brothers and sisters only Messiah's word is truth not a fleshly interpretation of his word not and we always need to be anchored and grounded and be rooted in the whole counsel of God dear brothers and sisters once again we and that includes me and my family as well that let us once again we do implore you please let us be like the active let us be like the Berians let us be active Berians like of Acts 17 12 and what what exactly do we mean by Berians the what what were the two important qualities of the Berians number one and from Acts 17 11 we understand that they receive the word with all readiness and that's not it number two the second chief character of Abirian is they search the scriptures daily to verify everything they learn. Dear brothers and sisters, both of them are important qualities to receive with an open mind because every time our learning, it's not the, com the complexity of a topic which hinders our learning. It, al it is always the notion that I got it, I already know it. If I always think I already know it, there's nothing new to it, then I won't be open to the leading of Ruach HaKodesh to understand it, dear brothers and sisters. And so many times we all have been victims of that. So let us pray together, dear brothers and sisters, to receive the word with an open mind, with all readiness. And let us go back. Let us dig deeper. And once again, we will leave all the links of, of our week one, of our introduction, as well as there will be the Q&A sessions for every single week of this journey so that is the very crucial part so we'll leave all the links dear brothers and sisters it will be up on our website we highly implore you once again please let us together invest our time in this exciting journey and be like the Berians and moreover let us ask Ruach HaKodesh to guide each one of us all through this journey because this staggering journey indeed is our greatest adventure dear brothers and sisters to know the one man who gave it all he had for you and me, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Yeshua HaMashiach, that one name which strikes a God once again. So the Bible says that our labor in Messiah is never in vain. So let us today go to the Lord in prayer and we once again hope, dear brothers and sisters, we hopefully we can keep these sessions to about 45 minutes, but please do bear with us. We will definitely not get past one hour, but hopefully we are hoping that that has been the biggest challenge because of the inexhaustibility of God's word. The time has been a biggest challenge for us, but we hope to keep it about 45 minutes. So let us today go to the Lord in prayer and let Messiah guide our steps in the staggering journey 
to know him and to keep Yeshua HaMashiach preeminent for he must increase and we should decrease. We must decrease. So let's start with the word of prayer. Shall we? Anna? Yes. All right. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, Holy Father, as we come in your presence, we thank you, Lord, for one more glorious day, one more glorious time, one more time. To dwell on Christology, to dwell on our Messiah, to know Him. Oh, Holy Father, as we come in your presence, we thank you, Lord, for being our God, for being our Lord, for being our Savior, for being our Heavenly Father, for being our all in all, Lord. Today we bring this time, myself and Anna and all of your fellow brethren, all your appointed people in thy presence, Lord, we pray, Lord, pour out your Spirit on each one of us. Open up, Lord, today in the journey of the book of Colossians, which you have ordained for us, Lord. Open up thy words to our hearts and lives and our hearts and lives to thy words, Lord, and help us, Lord, to see the glorious, the glorious Savior. Help us to know him, Lord. If that is your will, Lord, help us to know more about your attributes. Help us to know more about the sacrifice above every sacrifice, the transaction above every transaction which took place at Calvary, which took place at Golgotha, that today we can stand in front of you. Today we have the right standing in front of you because Messiah, Messiah died an excruciating death. We thank you, Holy Father, that you have called by thy grace and thy grace alone and not by any merit of our own Lord, God's riches at Christ's expense. So we bring this time in your presence. We surrender ourselves. I surrender Anna and myself and I surrender every single of our dear fellow brethren into thy mighty hands and pray Lord to thee as we look forward to learn more about our soul sustainer, our breath giver, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Lord, please once again teach us, Lord. You said that you will teach us Psalm 32, 8, Lord. You will Teach us, you will lead us, you will show us the way in Psalm 143 verses 8 and 10. So we claim on your word of Psalm 143 verses 8 and 10, Psalm 32, 8 and Psalm 25 verses 4 and 5. And pray, Lord, teach us and show us more about you and teach us, Lord, to do your will. And if it is your will, Lord, please do reveal to each and every single of our dear fellow brethren about your preordained will for each one of them so that in the days that remain we can honor you and glorify you not only through our lips but through our actions through our deeds through our lives through our entire being and we surrender without any reservation whatsoever we surrender all our dear fellow brethren Anna and myself and this time Lord every alphabet which comes out of our mouth we anoint it and surrender it unto thy mighty hands in the name above every single name of our soul sustainer our breath giver our all in all our Lord and our Savior Yeshua HaMashiach Jesus Christ of Nazareth Amen, amen and amen and amen. All right, you can please go ahead. And... So today we are going to look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. Let's take a quick review of what we saw last time. The book of Colossians was written at a time when the person of Christ was being denied. False teaching, which later came to be known as Gnosticism, was prevalent. This was basically an attempt to harmonize all religions and beliefs and present something pleasing to everyone. But as a result, Lord Jesus Christ's person was denied, whether his humanity or his deity. The book of Colossians was written to remind the church of the real truth and to help them fight the heresy and deception that was being sown among them in the church. However, it is important to note that although this was the purpose of the book, Paul did not start the letter in that way. Instead, the letter begins with a declaration of Christ's preeminence. That's what Paul starts it with. Today we are going to look at the section following Paul's greeting to the church. Paul's letters mostly contain a prayer, soon or immediately after the greeting. Before we jump in, let's take a look at the parallels between Colossians and Ephesians. As we saw last time, 78 verses of the book of Colossians parallel the letter to the Ephesians. Let's take a look at a few of them. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. Par parallel Colossians 1, 1 and 2. Ephesians 1, 6 and 7. Parallel Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, 10. 
parallels Colossians 1, 19 and 20. Ephesians 1, 15 and 16 parallels Colossians 1, 3 and 4. Ephesians 1, 17 through 21 parallels Colossians 1, 9 through 15. Ephesians 1, 18 and 1, 10 and 11 parallels Colossians 1, 16 and 18. Ephesians 1, 19 and chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 parallel Colossians 2, 12 and 13. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 parallels Colossians 1, 21. Ephesians 2, 13 and 16 parallels Colossians 1, 20 and Colossians 2, 14. Ephesians 3, 1 parallels Colossians 1, 24 and 25. Ephesians 3, 3 parallels Colossians 1, 26 through 29. Ephesians 4, 2 and 4 parallel Colossians 2, 12 through 15. Ephesians 4, 16 parallels Colossians 2, 19. Ephesians 4, 22 through 25 parallels Colossians 3, 9 and 10. Ephesians 4, 17 through 21 parallel, Ephesians, parallel Colossians 1, 21, chapter 2, verse 6 and chapter 3, verses 8 and 10. Ephesians 4, 29 parallels Colossians 4, 6. Ephesians 4.32 parallels Colossians 3.12 and 13. Ephesians 4.31 parallels Colossians 3.8. Ephesians 5.5-8 5, 5 through 8, parallels Colossians 3.5-8. through 8. Ephesians 5.15-16 parallels Colossians 4.5. Ephesians 5, 18 through 20 parallels Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Ephesians 5, 21 and 23 and chapter 6, verses 1 through 9 parallel Colossians 3, 18 through 25 and chapter 4, verse 1. Ephesians 6, 18 through 20 parallels Colossians 4, 2 through 4. And Ephesians 6, 21 and 22 parallels Colossians 4, 7 through 9. The Bible is one integrated message and we see that amazing design all across the scripture. Today we are going to look at Paul's prayer for the Colossian church to understand the passage more. Today we will look at chapter 1 verses 19 through 14. Let's first read this passage as a whole and then we will get into greater detail. Paul says, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So in verse 9, Paul says, Since the day we heard it, this phrase refers to verse 7 and also the previous verses. Paul is basically referring to, number one, their faith in Christ. Number two, their love for all the saints. Number three, the fruit of the word of God in them. And number four, their love in the spirit. Epaphras, one of Paul's companions, had brought news of these things to the apostle Paul. And from that day on, Paul never stopped praying for the church. And what were the things he prayed and asked from God for the church? First of all, that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. True wisdom is to understand what the Lord's will is. That's what Ephesians chapter 5 verse 17 tells us. To be unwise is to not understand his will. The book of Proverbs tells us a lot about being truly wise. There are three words in the book of Proverbs used to connote that idea. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Here in Colossians chapter 1 verse 9, we find the same three words used. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5 to understand more about the knowledge of his will and true wisdom and understanding. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 15 through 21 
tells us, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So we are directed to walk circumspectly. We know that the word circumspect means to be aware of all what is around us. According to this passage, the wisdom we need in life as true believers shows up in the following ways. Walking circumspectly, that is, understanding the times we are living in and what God wants us to be doing. And that will lead to the next thing, redeeming the time because the days are evil. As we walk circumspectly, we begin to understand that we are living in evil times. And that is why we must redeem the time. Understanding that the days are evil then leads us to pursue after understanding what God's will is so that we can walk in it, that is, redeeming the time. And as we understand God's will, we begin to feel His Spirit and begin to praise God. We see here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15-21, through 21, that each direction is followed by another statement. Walk circumspectly is followed by not as fools, but as wise. Redeem the time is followed by because the days are evil. Do not be unwise is followed by understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine is followed by in which is dissipation. Be filled with the Spirit is followed by speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and it goes on. Give thanks always for all things is followed by submitting to one another in the fear of God. We are to redeem the time because the, these days are evil. We are living in perilous, deceptive times. We see that all around us. And that is why we are to redeem the time. The word therefore in verse 17 connects it to the previous verse. So according to verses 16 and 17, our response to the evil of these days should be twofold. Number one, redeeming the time. And number two, understanding God's will. But it all starts with walking circumspectly. That is the key. We must understand the peril of the times we are living in. The next instruction in this passage is not to be drunk with wine, in which is a sotia, excess, but to be filled with the Spirit. And this is followed by verses 19 through 21, speaking to one, an, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. The Ephesian church must have been aware of the fact that the pagans at their drinking parties would offer hymns of praise to their god of wine. Thus, Paul here exhorts us to be filled with the Spirit and praise God rather than being filled with wine and praising false gods. We are instructed to give thanks for all things, always. So what is our motivation to thank God for everything? Because we know that He is good and His will is good and nothing that happens is apart from his will. That's what we see in Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 through 31. We see here again a hint at the Trinity. We see the Spirit in verse 18, and the Father and the Son in verse 20. Last time, we took a quick glimpse at a few mentions of the Trinity in the scripture. Today, let's take a further look at the attributes and the works of God, which we see attributed to each person of the Trinity in the scripture. Let's first take a look at the works of God. The creation is attributed to the Father in Psalm chapter 102, verse 25, to the Son in Colossians 1, 16, and John 1, 1 through 3, and to the Spirit in Genesis 1, 2, and Job 26, 13. The creation of man is attributed to the Father in Genesis 2, 7, to the Son in Colossians 1.16, and to the Spirit in Job 33.4. The incarnation of Christ is attributed to the Father in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, to the Son in Philippians 2.7, and to the Spirit in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. 
The death of Christ is attributed to the Father in Psalm 22:15 and Romans 8:32, to the Son in John 10:18 and Galatians 2:20, and to the Spirit in Hebrews 9:14. The atonement at the cross is attributed to the Father in Isaiah chapter 53 verses 6 and 10, to the Son in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2, and to the Spirit in Hebrews 9:14. The resurrection of Christ is attributed to the Father in Acts 2.24 and Romans 6.4, to the Son in John 10.17 and 18 and John 2.19, and to the Spirit in 1 Peter 3.18 and Romans 8.11. The resurrection of all mankind is attributed to the Father in John 5.21, to the Son in John 5.21, and to the Spirit in Romans 8.11. The inspiration of Scripture is attributed to the Father in 2 Timothy 3.16, to the Son in 1 Peter 1.10 and 11, and to the Spirit in 2 Peter 1.21. Sanctification is attributed to the Father in Jude 1.1, 1, 1, to the Son in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, and to the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Now let's take a look at the attributes of God. Eternal existence is attributed to the Father in Psalm chapter 90, verse 2, to the Son in Revelation 1, 8, to the, and to the Spirit in Hebrews 9, 14. Infinite power is attributed to the Father in 1 Peter 1, 5, to the Son in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and to the Spirit in Romans chapter 15, verse 19. Omniscience is attributed to the Father in Jeremiah 17, 10, to the Son in Revelation 2.23, and to the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 2.11. Omnipresence is attributed to the Father in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 24, to the Son in Matthew 18.20, and to the Spirit in Psalm 139.7. Holiness is attributed to the Father in Revelation 15.4, to the Son in Acts 3.14, and to the Spirit in Acts 1.8. Truth is attributed to the Father in John 7.28, to the Son in Revelation 3.7, and to the Spirit in 1 John 5.6. Benevolence is attributed to the Father in Romans 2.4, to the Son in Ephesians 5.25, and to the Spirit in Nehemiah 9.20. The three persons of the Trinity are distinct, but they are inseparable. Paul's second prayer request on the behalf of the Colossian church was that they would walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Today, is it truly our desire to please God? Galatians chapter 1 verse 10 tells us, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Paul had spent his past life trying to please the Pharisees he lived with by persecuting the followers of Christ. But he learned that what matters is, fall, is being fully pleasing to God. Paul prayed that the Colossians would become fruitful in good works. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 tells us, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We were created for a purpose which has already been laid out for us. We are not here to create a, a purpose for ourselves, but to walk in the purpose which God has already laid out for us. That is what true good works are. Our desire should be that we would be fruitful in every good work which God has ordained for us. Paul's third prayer request on behalf of the Colossian Christians was that they would be strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy. We know that the Bible says that long-suffering is a fruit of the Spirit, as we see in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The Bible also says that true love is patient, as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. We are called to patiently endure the suffering which God has ordained for us, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. That is our calling. But the strength to thus endure doesn't come from ourselves, our determination, or self-righteousness. This strength comes from God, and that is why this was Paul's prayer request on behalf of the Colossian church. It comes only from God. It is His glorious power. 
which will empower us, not anything of ourselves. The reason we need strength from God is because our calling is to endure suffering with patience, which we cannot do by ourselves. We need that strength in order to be long-suffering, to suffer long with joy. That is why we need strength. Paul's fourth and final prayer request on their behalf was that they would give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Paul told the Thessalonian church that it is the will of God for us to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in everything. This verse, Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, brings us to the point of predestination. It is God who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance he will give to his people who walk in his light. He did not choose us because we deserve it or because of anything we have done. We have not merited it. It is his grace, his mercy. He is the one who qualified us. It is not because of who we are. Verses 13 and 14 tells us, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Today, as true believers, we each have been delivered from the darkness we were once held by. We have been redeemed from the powers we were once held by. We were slaves to our sin. We were slaves to our flesh, Romans chapter 6, verse 20, to the world, Galatians chapter 4, verse 9, and to the devil, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. We had sold ourselves for our own iniquities, Isaiah 5, chapter 50, verse 1. And once we had sold ourselves, eventually we are left without strength in a hopeless situation. We could not deliver ourselves, Romans chapter 5, verse 6. It started with our own foolish choice, and in the end, we have no hope anymore. It would not be unjust for God to leave us without hope in this situation because we chose it. It would not be unjust for him to do that, but he did not leave us. He sent his only son to die in our place. He redeemed us from the powers that held us, the powers that we were in bondage to. He sent his own son to suffer in our place, as we see in Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 6. The cost of our redemption was his own son, and he did not spare him. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He gave his son that we might have eternal life through him, John 3, 16. We have been redeemed from these dark powers by the blood of Christ. And not only that, he has brought us into the kingdom of Christ, his only son. We see all across the scriptures how the Father does everything through his son, Jesus Christ. Christ is here called the son of his love. In Greek, it is agape huios. In the King James Version, it says dear son, but the word agape is a noun, not an adjective. As we saw last time, agape is unconditional love. The focus then shifts to Christ from verse 14 on. Verse 14 tells us, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In Christ, we have redemption, and that is possible because of his blood, because of the cross. Hebrews 9.22 tells us that without shedding of blood, there is no remission. We are today truly forgiven because of the blood of Christ. Today, before we conclude, let's take a look at the need for the blood sacrifice of the Old Testament through the perspective of the book of Hebrews. We as true believers are now under the new covenant. The new covenant is a fourfold promise. Number one, God's law will be written in our hearts and minds. Number two, he will be our God and we will be his people. Number three, no one has to teach anyone about God anymore. Number four, God will be merciful to our sins and our lawless deeds and will remember them no more. The new covenant may be co contrasted with the old in many ways, which the book of Hebrews lays out for us. The old covenant involved an old priesthood from the tribe of Levi and according to the order of Aaron. The new covenant involves a new priesthood from the tribe of Judah and according to the order of Melchizedek. The old covenant involved daily sacrifices. The new covenant is based on the once for all sacrifice. The Old Covenant was conditional. The New Covenant is unconditional. The Old Covenant involved a copy of the Heavenly Tabernacle. The New Covenant involves the very presence of God. Under the Old Covenant were continual sacrifices of bulls and goats. Under the New Covenant was the once for all sacrifice of Christ himself. Under the Old Covenant was no perfection. Under, under the New Covenant, righteousness is imputed. 
Under the old covenant, priests were made without an oath. Under the new covenant, Christ has been made high priest with an oath. The old covenant, under the old covenant, the priests were ordained according to the law of a fleshly commandment. Under the new covenant, the, the high priest is ordained according to the power of an endless life. Under the old covenant, the priests cannot continue by reason of death, and under, but under the new covenant, our high priest lives forever. Under the old covenant, the high priests were sinful, but under the new covenant, the high priest is sinless. Fault was found in the Old Covenant, but the New Covenant is faultless. The Old Covenant and the New Covenant are at two opposite ends. However, the two covenants have one thing in common. Both hang on the blood of the sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 19 and 20 tells us, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. The word commanded in the King James Version is enjoined. The people were under this covenant because of the blood of the sacrifice. If they stopped the sacrifices or stopped doing it the way God had ordained, the covenant would fall apart. God said that the Israelites had not continued in his covenant, so he disregarded them. In the Old Testament, what made God most angry with the Israelites was that they served idols, committed, a, committed adultery, and so on, and then came and stood in the temple. The priests offered corrupt, blemished sacrifices. When the Israelites began disobeying God regarding the sacrifices, the covenant fell apart. At the Last Supper, we all remember how Lord Jesus Christ took the bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And after that, he took the cup, blessed it and giving it to the disciples he said drink from it all of you for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins when lord jesus christ said it was his blood he was in essence instituting the new covenant the new covenant depends on his blood if we move away from the cross it falls apart the new covenant is that our sins and iniquities will be remembered no more and it is the blood of christ which covers and takes away our sins if we move away we no longer have that right standing with God. We are no longer covered. With our sinful self, we cannot stand in front of a holy God, which is why Lord Jesus Christ died to cover us. But if we move away from the cross, we are not covered and we cannot stand in front of God. That is why the blood of the sacrifice is the basis for the covenant. So what have we learned in this session? Number one, the book of Colossians resembles the book of Ephesians for the greater part. Over three quarters, or 75% of the book, resembles Ephesians. Number two, Paul gave thanks to God for the church for four reasons. Their faith in Christ, their love for all the saints, the fruit of God's word in them, and their love in the spirit. Number three, Paul's first prayer request on their behalf was wisdom. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 15 through 21 tells us more about what true wisdom is and how it shows up in a true believer's life. Number four, the three persons of the Holy Trinity are distinct persons, but they are inseparable. Each person of the Trinity is involved in everything God does. Number five, Paul's second prayer request on their behalf, that they would walk worthy of God. The true Christian's goal should be to please God in everything. Number six, Paul's third prayer request on their behalf, that they would be strengthened. It is God's power which will carry us through. Only his power can strengthen us to joyfully endure trials. Number seven, Paul's fourth and final prayer request on their behalf, that they would be able to give thanks to the Father. Once again, in our own strength, we cannot give thanks in everything. But that is God's will for us, as we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. And that's why we pray for it. Number eight, the cost of our redemption was the sacrifice of Christ himself, and God did not spare his own son. Number nine, the new covenant is possible because of Lord Jesus Christ's blood, and we must never move away from the cross. And today let us read Hebrews chapter nine, verses 11 through 15, as our take home message for this session. The author of Hebrews tells us, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, 
that is, not of his creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal, eternal inheritance. And before we end today, here are a few questions for us to examine ourselves. Number one, what are the reasons for which Paul is thankful on the behalf of the Colossian church? What is he referring to as he opens verse 9? Number two, what were Paul's four prayer requests on their behalf? Number three, what do we learn about true wisdom from Ephesians chapter 5 verses 15 through 21? What is the progression we see in these verses? Number four, what does the Bible tell us about the Trinity? Understanding that the three persons of the Trinity are distinct and yet each involved in every work of God and that they each do all things together, how should we respond as Lord Jesus Christ explains in John chapter 5 verses 22 and 23? Number five, what is the power of darkness as Paul talks about in Colossians 1.13? And number six, what do verses 13 through 14 teach us about the cost of our redemption? What does the phrase, son of his love, mean? What is the significance of such a phrase in this context? Number seven, what were the contrasts between the old and new covenants? Did they have anything in common? And if so, what is it? Number eight, why was the blood of the sacrifice essential? And number nine, what is redemption? Lord Jesus Christ is coming extremely soon. Today let us be in his presence and trust in him. And today let us fight the good fight, keep up the faith, and finish this race strong. Thank you everybody for viewing us, and may Lord Jesus Christ bless you all in abundance. Amen. Amen and amen and amen once again. Thank you so much, Anna, for taking us through Colossians 1, 9 through 14. What once again was striking as Anna was telling dear brothers and sisters that True wisdom. What exactly is true wisdom? That's something, dear brothers and sisters, let that sink in. The true wisdom is to know what is God's will for my life. It's not knowing all the scientific modern frontiers of science and all the things, whatever the world has to offer to us. And once again, dear brothers and sisters, I raise my hand. I was guilty of this before. Our great God, in His great mercy, he visited me and he delivered me. I once was blind, but he offered and he gave the free gift of eternal life and opened my eyes. Just staggering, 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 dear brothers and sisters. Today, please do come to that fountain of living water. He has so much more to offer than we can ever imagine, dear brothers and sisters. James chapter 3, I believe, verses 13 through 18. There is a comparison between... The wisdom of the world, which is demonic wisdom, and then wisdom of God, which is to know our own, as Anna was sharing, that what is God's will for the days that remain, dear brothers and sisters? What is God's will for you and me in the days that remain? So once again, dear brothers and sisters, we thank you so very much for being a part of Bini Scripture Contemplations with our 11-year-old. We will definitely have the summary of what we learned today on our website, as well as, as well as, the Q and A of our hope, the homework assignment questions, because the Q and A once again, dear brothers and sisters, is the most important. Our homework assignments will be a very crucial key to this journey. Once again, dear brothers and sisters, let us understand the parable. Going back to the basics, parable of sower, we see four grounds. Three of them fell apart. Why they did not? It, the word did not bear fruit. If we are, if we are not the fourth ground, dear brothers and sisters, if we are not dwelling, ruminating, meditating on His word, we won't be the fourth ground. We will be deceived, left and right, horizontally. We will be deceived. It is time, dear brothers and sisters, to truly, truly dig deeper in His word. It is time, truly, to seek Him. It is time, truly, to ask Lord, what do you have for me during this hour? And the next hour, 
that's where that's the time we are living in so let us seek him with all our heart with all our mind with all our strength with our entire being because the bible says in him we move in him we live move live and move and have our entire being is that the reality today is that the reality of our life because the question is today do we have that vibrant hope of getting our hyperdimensional glorified bodies as first john 3 2 tells us and if so are we purifying ourselves by yielding to the sanctification ministry of the indwelling holy spirit because the scripture tells us dear brothers and sisters that the only way we can be purified is through his word are we dwelling meditating contemplating and ruminating on his word in the true sense are you is it purifying you and me? Is it purifying us? Is it purifying you? That's the question in the days that remain. So we will leave every, once again the link in the, in the comment section, in the description box, as well in the comment section for our... We will also leave the link to our introduction as well as our week one, dear brothers and sisters, if you have not gotten a chance to join us. So we do highly implore you, please do take a, please do take a look at it. Please do pray over, let Messiah's will be done in these end moments, dear brothers and sisters. Let us keep praying for each other. Let us hold hands on this virtual platform. Let us keep praying for each other. For we truly believe that Messiah's return is upon us. And in the days that remain, we stand on greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world and messiah's grace is sufficient for each one of us because in our weaknesses we will be made strong and god will be glorified in our weaknesses so let us surrender to our coming and reigning king yeshua hamashiach in our weaknesses and today let us end with a short word of prayer shall we Anna? yes all right you can please go ahead lord jesus once again i bring our souls near presence lord and i thank you lord for once again giving us this opportunity to dwell on your word, Lord. And bless us as we go forth from here. And help us, Lord, to be in your presence, Lord. And to keep ruminating on your word, Lord. And bless all our viewers, Lord. And help us, Lord, to be in your presence at all times, Lord. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Once again, we thank you so much, Anna, for praying for us. And also, dear brothers and sisters, please do bear with us to, for the sound quality. We hope that we can hear we can hear you can hear with the sound quality we do apologize for that due to the limitations on our behalf with the equipment but our god is unlimited may his ruach once again speak to our hearts may his ruach guide us and lead us we thank you so very much once again all of dear fellow brethren for being a part of this journey of beery and scripture contemplations which messiah led us with our 11 year old and we do hope once again if you have any questions dear brothers and sisters Please, please do not hesitate to contact us. We do so. Look forward to hear from you and learn together because this is eternal life that we know. We may know him and we can only know him through his word. We thank you, dear brothers and sisters. And may Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, bless you all in abundance for his greater glory. Shalom.